I sort of chuckle at the customer that asks me, what time in the morning do I wake up to bake all this bread on market day? Um, as though the process is just a few hours in length uh, from start to finish. Um, I think that I was that customer, which is why I, I sort of chuckle, like thinking that you can bake really high quality bread in a matter of start to finish a few hours. Uh, but in reality, there's basically, you know, an around the clock process that's happening in the background. We uh, have to get butter sheeted and ready for uh, the croissant dough. We're ultimately creating layers and layers and layers of dough butter, dough butter, dough butter. The best way that we know how to do that is to do a lot of preparation um, to make life easy over at the sheeter. So we're essentially going to take equal sized uh, shapes of butter and dough and sandwich them together. In our case, a common sort of standard size is the size of a sheet tray. Uh, so right now the dough sheets have already been stretched the size of a sheet tray and we are incrementally stretching out the butter to the size of a sheet tray. You have uh, two halves here, three blocks smashed and two blocks smashed. And they're in pairs and they make it over here to the sheeter where they now become a entire uh, sheet. Now that butter has to be held in a five to seven degree temperature window forevermore until you laminate. So you can refrigerate it, but then you have to get it back to temperature. And by the way, it can never really reach a high temperature where it starts to melt because they'll never come back together just in this way. Actually leading up to this, we were talking about how nice it is to be able to sheet butter and immediately laminate because the quality of the butter is higher when you do so. It's essentially like not losing its pliability, whereas over time, butter will sort of incrementally lose its pliability the more it's handled, the more it's refrigerated and thawed, refrigerated and thawed. So it's kind of nice to work in a line like this and get it all the way ready for lamination. So now that butter is at a nice temperature, I would bet mid 60s uh, if I had to put money on it. Uh, and basically Dylan's gonna be able to go right into laminating it. This is like a legendary piece. The handle has a story that goes all the way back to Jared's time with the bakery and something that happened with this end of this rolling pin. It's made it the whole way, but what do you do in a home garage to flatten butter when you basically only have rolling pins? You find R2-D2. Uh, at an auction yard, uh, and it's, it's actually, it was an auction and it was a hotel in Colorado that probably didn't know what to do with this thing. Uh, I guess probably sometime in their history they started making their own bread and then stopped, and this was some sort of a foreign device to them. So I picked it up, I think for like $600. Uh, brand new, it's 10 times that. and. It's actually meant to divide buns into 36 equal pieces. We do that when we make buns, but we're kind of an artisan bakery, so we don't, you know, it's not like our specialty buns. We do love making hot cross buns for uh, the holidays uh, or other, like in the fall and winter, we'll make um, dinner rolls, sourdough dinner rolls. People love those. but. Actually, this thing is mostly a butter press, um, which is not what it was designed to do. You can just barely squeeze blocks of butter between two parchments, and then basically this thing and its left function just presses down a big plate between another plate. Uh, with dough, it would be degassing the dough in this point and kind of spreading it evenly across the plate then 36 cutters come in and cut it into equal pieces, and then there's actually a rounding function. But you'll have to come back for making buns to see that. 
right now all we're going to do is press down Dylan is refining it and warming it some. So it's going from refrigerated cold all the way to room temperature warm in a matter of actually minutes and is ready to use. That was another problem that we had in the beginning. The amount of time wasted waiting for butter to thaw and pulling the trigger early on the lamination only to have shattered dough. So if butter is too cold to pass through with your dough, then it will literally shatter into thousands and thousands of pieces as you try to flatten it. Uh, and you see that all through your pastry dough and sort of, you know, just have a terrible time thereafter. It, the final croissant can be even passable and almost indistinguishable to the customer that isn't looking at the crumb structure, which most customers probably don't when they eat a croissant. But you as the baker have just had a miserable experience the entire time that you're working with a dough because you have to stare at this shattered dough thereafter. You see it on the table, shattered. You see it baking and you see all the little clumps of butter everywhere and it just, uh, it's infuriating. Uh, so we used to have to kind of manually wait for the dough, for the butter to go from 38 degrees in the fridge to 65. And we tried to intervene with a bludgeon. Uh, and believe it or not, that's not the most efficient way to uh, warm butter up. Uh, it might work if that's like the only thing you've got to do all day long, which by the way, like we, we were there, like we were the bakery paying labor hours for somebody to sit there and bludgeon butter for a while and wake up our whole house. <laughs> uh, I would then follow for like a 16 hour day where I was laminating between like wooden boards. You can go back into our Instagram feed and see me laminating through like a wooden pass through pasta roller. And this was just three years ago at this point, like three years ago today. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting how quickly things can change. You know, we're gonna take this pear now and Dylan is gonna take this into a full sheet. Uh, we discovered these silpats into our journey with sourdough because we didn't have a culinary background uh, going into this in a traditional sense. So we didn't even know such things existed. Uh, I believe somebody who worked for us, you know, suggested them. And so we ordered them for the first time and they were interesting because butter could pass through, you know, um, rolling pins without the sill pats breaking. If you try to do this with the parchment paper, the parchment will break into the butter. It's much easier to deal with parchment you know, throughout the bakery because easy to grab, easy to apply. Uh, but sill pats are reusable and more durable in nature. So now we're using basically the function of the sheeter uh, minus a few components. We've uh, taken out like the scraper blades on the sheeter. So it's basically just two rolling pins that are coming closer and closer together to help uh, this butter spread out to the size of now a sheet tray, uh, a sheet pan, which is uh, in a matching way the size of the dough right now that's going to get laminated. So uh, we're basically now matching the butter up with the dough. At some point it starts to uh, create more friction between those two rolling pins and it starts to get harder and harder to spread it out and that's when we sort of take the process over manually. We kind of look, look for that last, last push through, which even gives us some extra material to work with. I like that I can feel um, when it's still pressing. I put my hand on the handle. Another weird like equipment modification in the sense that like as we're working with the sheeter, Dylan's sort of describing that you can like feel the tension of the rolling pin uh, narrowness and the friction that it's creating with the butter that's passing through it. So you pretty much kind of almost know when to stop. 
based on the tension that the resistance that you're feeling from the actual rolling pins interacting with the uh, regulator, the the wheel that uh, you know goes millimeter by millimeter down. So essentially, a sheeter is just a very very advanced rolling pin. This is what is being created. And now we're going to basically evenly roll this out to a thickness that amounts to, at first, just a millimeter or two, and then ends up becoming fractions of millimeters as the layers grow more and more with every fold. So it's a roll out, fold up, create triple the layers, roll out, fold up, create triple the layers, roll out, fold up, create triple the layers. Meanwhile, you have to refrigerate in between in order to keep that butter at an optimal pliable temperature. So again, speed becomes the entire equation with lamination. If you can't achieve speed, you'll start to see performance degradation in your lamination. This is my indicator of what's happening inside this room. Um, and it's really helpful to have it visible like this because um, one of the more nerve-wracking pieces of the process uh, is whether the proofing is happening accordingly for your, uh, really for all your products uh, that, that require it. Uh, in sourdough fermentation, uh, proofing has to happen at a much lower temperature. Uh, 84 degrees Fahrenheit is the perfect sort of intersection between uh, the fermentation of lactobacillus and the naturally occurring yeast that's in a sourdough starter. Uh, so if you can create that type of an environment uh, plus humidity, then you sort of maximize the rise uh, or the sort of expansion of that colony again. It's the same thing as a sourdough starter uh, and taking care of Harriet when we you know feed her uh, periodically and create you know this multiplication effect of the cell colony uh, but it's happening in a finished product in a dough uh, so inside we have space basically for these rags uh, and they sort of make a journey around when they're here they're basically the first ones that are ready to grab uh, and to move on to the next stage of the process. Now, a lot of products live in the proofing environment for a pretty large period of time. Uh, in sourdough baking, sort of a matter of, a measure of hours. In sort of yeasted baking, the whole proofing process is a measure of minutes. Uh, and this is actually another drawback to you know why we're having trouble with bread uh, because it sort of goes back to another part of the process and that's the breakdown of wheat uh, so your body is breaking down wheat after you digest it uh, but in a sourdough process the breakdown of wheat is actually occurring during the process of baking uh, in a yeasted baking process that process is often so fast that the wheat is not very broken down at all, uh, leaving most of the work to your gut. Uh, this is a literal measure that's uh, kind of an order of magnitude, it seems greater. We spend days uh, through a fermentation cycle. By the time you have the sourdough starter that's inoculating the doughs that are going all day in a bulk, and then basically, maximizing their rise through this day-long process of proofing. So pastries live in the proofer six hours for us, eight, sometimes longer. This depends on the rate of your sourdough starter and, and its ability to keep up. You can't go too long because then the dough itself starts to degrade over time. Uh, but there is a magic sweet spot in which you can create a beautiful result. Uh, so. Other products live in that proofing environment for shorter periods of time than pastry. I think croissants are one of the more intensive, but you can now see uh, that basically the layers have begun to separate. If I do a touch test, I'm getting kind of a weak response back, but that response is still there, which 
Uh, it's kind of an indicator of life in the dough itself. Uh, same with the uh, sourdough croissant here. I can see kind of the layers of lamination. Uh, that's another important thing is that the, the proof can't be so warm as to destroy the layering that you did in the step that came before it. So if you proof something in a commercial proofer that you can just get online, uh, those things are designed for yeasted products. So they're going to heat up sometimes to like 120 degrees. At that rate, all the butter just melts out of the pastry and ends up on the sheet tray, which is perfectly dry to the touch after an overnight proofing process. But these are now going to pop in the oven. They are missing one step, though, before they get to the oven. Uh, these are morning buns. So it's another variation on the croissant dough. Uh, in this case, they're spun around, and there's cinnamon sugar um, in the layers in between. So you have the 81 layers of dough and butter basically sandwiched between layers of cinnamon sugar made in a pinwheel shape. Uh, these will bake to a different form than these, as well as these, and even these sort of braided savory pastries that we're gonna make. So out of this one bake, we have both sweet and savory. These will be finished with rosemary, uh, some, uh, and the key component to the, the whole skin of a croissant is the egg wash component. So uh, that's kind of what leads after this is uh, you take these, uh, these pastries and actually apply a coat of egg wash, uh, which gives it its shine in the oven. If you put these directly in the oven now, they basically are the equivalent of baking bread without steam. They, they sort of come out ashy looking and not as pretty. Uh, also, the egg wash adds a little bit of a textural component to the outer crust. So you can influence it based on like, what you do with egg wash. Um, so even with egg wash, not all egg washes are created alike. Uh, when you buy a croissant you know, in, that's been mass produced, Certainly the croissant's not finished with egg, it's just finished with something that makes it shiny at the end. Uh, whatever the, the cheapest route there is, probably, for the mass-produced factory croissant. Um, so, you know, our, our hard line in the sand as a sort of an artisan bakery is, yes, you can do things at larger scale, but do you maintain sort of the integrity of the artisan intention in the product, meaning, you know, is designed for an egg wash finish. So that means we need to incorporate that in our process. We can't just say, oh, well, the egg washing at the end's non-essential. Let's just go with some sort of weird synthetic oil, you know. Uh, I don't want to eat the synthetic oil. So, you know, that's, we could have, I guess, grown to there, but that's not really, you know, the intention behind what we do. So anyway, uh, it's really nice to see these pastries in this particular point in time. Uh, it's a brief point in time, so you have to really come to the bakery at the right exact moment uh, when this happens. You can, if you heard that chirp in the background, it's the oven that's now warmed up, ready for these pastries to be accepted in. Uh, and so in the meantime, we just need to get some egg on top. Our egg wash is uh, just the yolks um, and a little bit of whole milk and some salt. Uh, the protein in the yolks and in the milk provide the shine, while the fat gives it that caramelization. I'm brushing these on now because there aren't that many of them. But when we do them for market, we have a sprayer that allows us to be a little faster. It's nice because we used to only be able to bake 16 trays at a time, which is still a lot of pastries. But this is 40 trays in one bake. It still kind of blows my mind, actually. The spraying is efficient. But um, there's something kind of zen about brushing the egg wash on. 
egg wash is really simple, but also like the pastries themselves. The fact that there's flour, water, salt, and in these guys, butter, and then some sugar. Not a lot of sugar. It's like, it's a nice connection to tradition. Like this is how these were made historically. There's nothing that we need to add. And um, thyme, I think, is an important ingredient. I think it's nice to think of thyme as an ingredient in itself. These are rosemary twists. So fresh rosemary from John and Amanda's garden. The egg wash also helps toppings like this to stick. And on the morning buns, we use them to kind of seal, seal them together so that they don't unfurl in the oven. So just some flaky sea salt. These guys are funny. They'll fall over sometimes during the proof. They'll bake up beautifully. These have just a little bit of cinnamon and sugar. In this bakery, I'm looking forward to trying out this in like a muffin tin to make it even more like a cinnamon roll. Although these are one of the most popular pastries at the markets. It's really nice to see, like, uh, for me, from beginning to end, you know, I, I did this mix, um, and I'll get to sell these at the farmer's market. Well, it's a smaller bake, so I wanted to readjust uh, the trays so that they're evenly spaced. It feels a bit like a spaceship launch every time. So I don't know if you can hear the steam, but that spindle is lifting up the entire rack. 